we will resume uh, our hearing of August 18th, and next we'll be hearing from Mount Esketney. Thank you all for, for joining us today. Thank you for having us. Nice to see you again. Likewise. Uh, I'll have Mr. McCracken swear in uh, the Mount Esketney team. Uh, you'll provide uh, your opening statements, and then I'll turn to Director Lindbergh's team uh, for their presentation. Uh, so good morning, Chairman uh, Foster. Oh, you get first. I'm so sorry to interrupt. Could you tell me who said thank you for having us at your table and how to spell your name? Uh, Wynn Brown, interim CEO, W-I-N-F-I-E-L-D, Winfield Brown. Thank you. Hey, thank you. And I think if you don't mind uh, to the Mount Scotney team, if you could, uh, for the record, introduce yourselves. So uh, Winfield Brown, the interim CEO here at Mount Scotney, David Sandville, uh, CFO, and Andrew Garamy, G-A-R-A-M-I, is our financial analyst. Great, thanks very much. I'll go ahead and swear you in if you would raise your right hands. <clears throat> Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. Great. Uh, thanks very much, and the floor is yours. Okay, great. Uh, we just uh, have, uh, uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Winfield Brown. Uh, he's our interim, and uh, he's been here a couple weeks. Yeah, three weeks as of today. And so uh, he's probably not going to be a uh, uh, active participant, so to speak, uh, since he's still learning Vermont and Mount Scotney. But uh, I thought he would just mention who he is and where he's from and how he got here. Uh, so when Brown, uh, week three here, as many of you probably know, Joe Paris, the longtime CEO here, has uh, taken over as CEO of Cheshire Medical Center uh, in New Hampshire. Um, so I've joined the team uh, working closely with Dave and, and company. I'll say that in my first three weeks, I'm very impressed with the team here, very lean, very competent, uh, very focused on the community, as I think you know historically. Uh, and of course, this is my first Green Mountain Care Board. I've heard a lot about it from other colleagues over the years, and so look forward to um, providing some benefit where I can, and I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Okay. So we'll just uh, roll through some uh, slides here. I know you guys have uh, been through the gauntlet for the last couple of weeks, and uh, um, uh, I've shared this with uh, Sarah Lindbergh, so certainly you guys can circulate it and uh, we'll only hit the high points. Uh, quick agenda, uh, we did the introduction uh, and we're going to really try to spend some time on quality access and costs as it relates to our budget and uh, outline our request and some of the reasoning behind it and then uh, whatever you folks have. I'm sorry, we have a fly in the room here. Um, so go ahead. Keep going. So our mission to improve the lives of those we serve and uh, who we are. Uh, so we are part of the Dartmouth Health System. Uh, we are in the bottom left-hand corner of the slide uh, and our uh, subsidiary historic homes of Runnymede um, is uh, listed there as well. Uh, you'll notice for those who've been uh, seeing our presentation for the last several years that uh, there is a new box on uh, on this uh, org chart, and that is Southwestern Vermont Medical Center, uh, who recently uh, became the newest member of the Dartmouth Health System. Uh, we focus on three things here, quality, uh, cost, and access, and that is the driver for pretty much everything we do here. And so we've recently been awarded uh, some recognition from Becker's Hospital Review, top recommended hospitals in Vermont, top uh, Vermont hospitals for patient experience, and top Vermont hospitals for patient experience. And basically, I put the questions, the indicators that we scored very high on, on there. Uh, additionally, we received an unexpected award from Press Ganey, uh, which was just released a couple months ago. Uh, for the Human Experience Garden, Guardian of Excellence Award. And so we hit the 95th percentile for patient experience. Uh, and uh, so we're very proud of that. Uh, next slide. Uh, 
we have a very strong quality department here. Um, to be frank, uh, we probably have more <laughs> FTEs uh, in this uh, department than most critical access hospitals are to have. Um, we uh, really focus on the next patient, the next survey, uh, the next situation. Uh, we've maintained our five-star CMS rating for patient experience. We're uh, annually in the top 15% in the country for overall hospital ratings. Um, we are, we've just engaged with the Dartmouth Health System for continuous improvement initiatives, which is a press gainy tool and uh, to provide constant monitoring and feedback on various aspects of the patient experience here at, at uh, Mount Escutney. Uh, we just re uh, recertified and reaccredited by the uh, Commission on Accreditation of Rehabilitative Facilities, CARF. Um, we're one of the smallest facilities in the country to have CARF certification. And uh, we did it this year with an uh, emphasis on stroke specialty designation, uh, since we receive a number of uh, post-stroke patients from uh, Dartmouth Hitchcock. Um, it's a three-year accreditation. This year, we also added um, CARF certification for our outpatient therapies program. And we have some of the highest uh, rehab scores for the CMS measures, uh, frankly, in the country, and certainly uh, of the handful of CAHs who have a distinct party unit for CARF. Uh, we just also had our CMS uh, recertification uh, just a couple weeks ago. Uh, we literally had only one uh, um, item to look at, and that was a wording change in a single policy. Everything else was scored excellent with, with zero concerns. And uh, again, it just speaks to our, uh, our goal of being constantly ready uh, for the next patient and the next survey and not trying to cram every two or three years to uh, get prepared for the next survey. So one of the things about our quality measures uh, is they're strong pretty much across the board, whether it's radiology, it's laboratory, uh, clinic related, uh, we, we have strong measures consistently. And frankly, it comes with a price. Um, you know, we talk about all the time in Vermont, the three stools of uh, healthcare, uh, access, quality, and cost, all equally important. And sometimes we have to make decisions on how we, uh, uh, how we prioritize those in the, in the current environment. And so, it, it, you know, just putting in quality standards, expectations, or initiating new programs, it takes management, there's data and analytics, we have mock audits, there's software usually involved. And uh, so there is a real a direct cost to uh, engaging at the level we engage at for quality. Obviously, we're doing that for uh, patient safety, but it also uh, feeds into employee satisfaction, engagement, retention, recruitment. People want to know they're working for a place that cares about quality uh, and safety for their patients. Um, we, uh, year to year, with the Dartmouth-Hitchcock Employee Engagement Survey, uh, we've been the top scorer in, in the system over the last three years, and our top uh, item is that our employees feel that we're focused on quality and safety for our patients. Uh, talk quickly about access. Uh, this is similar to uh, slides we've used in the past. These are the uh, specialties that we offer um, at Mount Escutney, color coded to reflect whether it's uh, a Dartmouth employee, uh, employed uh, provider working here, it's someone that we employ. Or we have some departments that are a combination. Uh, we've really not changed our footprint in this regard um, uh, for, for many years. And so uh, this is really what we're measuring access against are these specialties. Um, the last two years, our visit lag report, um, we've made a significant improvement in getting patients in the door. I wish uh, we could say that uh, we're doing an excellent job at all times in all clinics. It is a constant process of monitoring uh, and managing, uh, but we've made material changes and improvements to the statistics that we provide to the Green Mountain Care Board. So just like quality, 
you want to improve access, it requires ongoing monitoring of clinic and ancillary productivity. Uh, we periodically monitor wait times. Uh, we look at the regional need. Uh, we have, uh, we're in an area uh, where we have uh, three, arguably four, uh, other critical access hospitals that we bump up against, and obviously uh, the tertiary uh, care center at Dartmouth. And uh, like all, like the rest of the CAHs, um, you know, we have uh, providers who, from time to time, decide to move on, retire, and so we have to kind of look at how that affects all of our referral patterns and how we're managing patients. Uh, the other facilities have the same issues, so we have to periodically kind of come up out of our hole and look to see what's going on. Uh, in the area around us and, and what barriers are there for people receiving the care that they need. We identify those barriers and uh, we make great effort to reduce, remove, minimize those, uh, those, those barriers. Sometimes that's with staffing, sometimes it's with the provider complement, sometimes it's just changing hours and schedules of those clinics. And then we have a, a, a committee that meets uh, every two weeks called SLAM, and that's service line activation management. So anytime we materially change um, a line of service or we have something that's happened that we feel is untoward for relative to access, um, we convene and uh, determine how best to solve that problem. Uh, there were some questions with the Green Mountain staff uh, this year regarding the uh, walk-in services uh, that, uh, um, that we initiated uh, uh, almost two years ago. And, uh, and so we've been um, removing uh, people who would normally be going into the ER with low acuity problems and putting them into a walk-in clinic within our primary care confines uh, to reduce costs for everyone involved, but uh, also to uh, uh, provide the appropriate service in the appropriate location. And with all of these uh, efforts to improve access, we're always talking about what's the return on investment? What's it going to cost us to improve the access for the patients? Cost. So this is the third leg of the stool. Um, I've listed uh, and, and generally consistent with prior submission information. These are the services that relate to cost management that we engage with uh, Dartmouth Health System, uh, you know, on a daily, weekly, monthly, annual basis. Um, many of these uh, result in some uh, uh, significant reductions in cost, uh, if, as opposed to us doing this on our own. Um, we actually get Dartmouth Health pricing um, as an affiliate. Dartmouth also runs uh, a group called NEA, and N-E-A-H, and uh, um, NEA is a buying group for uh, not only Dartmouth and their affiliates, but also other regional providers in Vermont and New Hampshire. And so that's the first tier of discount. And if you're an affiliate uh, for many contracts, we get into another uh, tier of discount um, uh, as an affiliate. So that's probably the biggest area of cost control relative to Dartmouth. Uh, there are a couple other items that were asked uh, in our narrative and with the staff questions that were addressed and we're happy to take questions on those. Uh, but we're also leveraging them uh, for regional lab services, uh, uh, unified PACS system, oversight from uh, pathologists and uh, reading radiologists. The CHNA, all of that gets done uh, as a group and regionally, which I think is good for everyone involved, but uh, most notably in pricing. And uh, we'll just roll to the next slide. Uh, we're largely fixed expense as a critical access hospital. Um, as low as 70%, arguably 90%, depending on what audit firm you talk to. I generally like to believe that we're about 80% fixed expense. Um, some of that is related to our conditions of participation with Medicare as a critical access hospital. There are certain services that we're obligated to offer um, and uh, a minimum standard for offering of those services. Uh, the most obvious one is the emergency room, which needs to be open 24 hours a day. Um, I'll go back, please. Start. Yeah. Uh, so staffing ratios, uh, we look at those all the time. How many nurses, RNs do we have for every patient on the floor? 
what's our minimum staffing for the emergency room? How are we staffing the clinics? What do we need in ancillary services? Um, so we're constantly looking to keep those as in control as possible, but uh, the large percent of fixed expense really prohibits us from moving that needle too much. Um, we largely provide community-based services. We don't have any niche services. We don't have our, uh, subspecialty services here. We just provide what's appropriate for our community and uh, we do it as, as well as we can. Uh, we have monthly department P&L and FTE reports that are reviewed with department managers. Um, over the last uh, 15 months or so, we've been shorthanded in finance, uh, but prior to that, uh, we had uh, three or four finance people who would go out and meet with uh, department managers, specifically the clinical managers, to ensure that they're managing their staffing according to volume and their expenses as well. Um, senior leadership goes through position control weekly. Um, we have a, a kind of a catchphrase here, just because we budgeted it doesn't mean we're hiring for it. So. Uh, and whenever a job opens up, there's a position that needs to be posted. We analyze how is that department doing? Um, you know, what changes could be made as an alternative to hiring an FTE? And, uh, and over the last uh, two years, we've been a little bit more aggressive with partnering with other hospitals in the region to share staff. Um, uh, example, uh, one example is a respiratory therapy. We hired a float respiratory therapist. We uh, float them back and forth between Valley Regional and Claremont and here in Windsor to cover vacations and lessening our need for travelers. Uh, we have uh, a nursing pool within Dartmouth Health uh, that uh, we can all draw nursing from as opposed to travelers uh, saving everyone money. And uh, we're constantly leveraging uh, the Dartmouth Health system for GPO pricing and uh, other purchasing items. Uh, one of the questions that came up from the staff, I just wanted to touch on it quickly, is that we have been migrating for a number of years towards the uh, Dartmouth Health benefits platform so that we can offer one set of benefits for all affiliates in Dartmouth. And uh, we're, we're going to be live on that January 1st, which will be the start of the second quarter of our fiscal year. Uh, Apples to apples, our current uh, uh, offering versus what we'll be uh, offering our employees in January was about a $250,000 savings with slightly better uh, benefit platform. Uh, we also will be migrating our retirement platform January 1st, and uh, we'll be offering our employees a better plan uh, 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 with better options, but also uh, they'll retain about $200,000 a year because of reduced fees. Uh, administratively, we won't save any money, but we'll be passing that on to our employees, which is fabulous. Uh, and then uh, the 340B mixed use, which is our in-house in pharmacy, um, our savings working through the Dartmouth uh, uh, GPO programs for pharmacy uh, and working uh, with the manufacturers, uh, we've been able to increase our mixed use savings on 340B from uh, approximately 200 change to we're annualizing about $440,000 in savings this fiscal year and ongoing. Uh, there was a question about the um, Valley Regional Hospital, what savings uh, do we expect? And this is what we are projecting if this were to happen, uh, let's say September uh, or October 1st of 23, we expect that we would move the needle uh, about $700,000 here at Mount Escotney over the coming months, and Valley would uh, actually benefit even greater. Uh, some of that would be them moving from a, a lower level of discount to a higher level of discount as an affiliate of Dartmouth, uh, but we will have common oversight, common management, and we'll pick up some efficiencies there, as well as some uh, more efficient staffing between the two facilities by sharing staff. So our request, uh, as you know, we've asked for a 5.1% rate increase. Um, I put the slide up that uh, Sarah Lindbergh was, uh, um, had shared last year and then updated for this year. Um, the circle is, is obviously us. Um, you know, we asked for 5.1%. Our, our rate request year to year, you can see, is a pretty tight band. There's only two other hospitals in the state who have done a better job over this period of six years. 
uh, managing their rate increases. Um, what's interesting about it is uh, I, I listened to the uh, couple of the hearings and uh, um, you know we're asking for 5.1 and as you know we don't get 5.1. So the actual net increase that we'll be getting after deductions is about 2.4%. Um, so Medicare, we're going to realize uh, 2.4, Medicaid 1.3 of that 5.1, commercial will be about 3.4% of the 5.1, and uh, the self-pay is essentially zero. Um, we do have an MPSR uh, increase of 6.8% budget to budget, so doing quick and simple math, taking 2.4% off that, the remainder of our increase is 4.4%. Uh, uh, relative to volume and intensity of services. Capital, uh, as I've said in prior years, uh, Mount Scutney uh, seldom has a sexy capital project that I talk about in our presentation. Uh, we're doing about $3.2 million in capital next year, uh, mostly facility, facility improvement, mechanicals. I've highlighted our most significant investments for next year our CSR renovation and uh, the equipment uh, associated with that is really going to come to about $750,000. And that is a regulatory requirement that is not optional for us. Um, and we've actually been trying to get that done for a couple of years, but with bandwidth and the availability of contractors and, and whatnot, uh, it's been impossible to get it done sooner. We have some rooftop units, some other major mechanical, uh, and we do have a Dartmouth initiated uh, project, which is rebranding, wayfinding, signage, and all of that that we'll be implementing in the next fiscal year. Uh, of note, uh, we've been undersp underspending for capital, as you probably heard from most, if not all other uh, hospitals, basically because of uh, bandwidth and supply chain issues. Um, uh, but uh, maybe the most important thing on this particular slide is we will be migrating to the Dartmouth Hitchcock IT platform, uh, effective in FY25, which means that we will be filing a request in FY24. Um, and we anticipate that that's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of approximately $9 million. So this is, uh, this is what we're all here to do, right? This is, this is what it all boils down to is uh, functionally we've asked for a 2.4% uh, uh, net rate increase. Uh, virtually 80% of our supply, uh, um, our expenses are coming in with inflation uh, increases greater than that. Um, travelers, benefits, and utilities have actually been favorable and we're projecting them to be more favorable than they've been in the recent past, uh, which is great. Um, that said, uh, everything else is going up uh, much more than 2.4%. And this brings us to the, this slide, which is, you know, we look at those three legs of the stool and every year we have to kind of figure out how to thread the needle. Um, just from an operating margin perspective, we, we have to look at what the Green Mountain Care Board would like us to do. We have expectations coming to us from the Dartmouth Health System. We have expectations of our board of trustees and we look at our own financial ratios and determine what we need to fund capital uh, and whatnot going off into the future. And at the same time, we have to figure out what our investment is going to be in quality to maintain the quality that we've uh, achieved, but also to incrementally improve it over time. Uh, as we mentioned earlier, access, same thing. We look at what's it gonna cost to improve access for our communities to the care that they require and 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 should and deserve and then we also look at healthcare reform and what the likely changes are in the state of vermont for that and that's how we arrive at our request of 5.1 percent rate increase 2.4 um, net rate increase and uh and we try to thread the needle where we come in reasonable in the scope of what's going on in the vermont marketplace and uh hitting the other things that uh, the state of vermont uh, feel is important most notably access and quality. Uh, over at our operating margin over time, I think I just kind of, I can't see that with the uh, presentation here, but I think it's uh, uh, one, it was roughly 1% uh, over the last 10 years. 
uh, which I think is very reasonable. Uh, if we were in other states, we would be shooting for two and a half, three as a critical access hospital. Um, quick discussion on risks and opportunity. Uh, you've heard the healthcare workforce uh, probably ad nauseum over the last two weeks. Uh, we have wage pressures. Uh, not only do we have the same wage pressures as everybody else in Vermont, but we're also competing against our mother company who's competing against Boston. So um, they also opened a new tower uh, a few months ago, hiring hundreds of nurses and other support staff and none of this helped the employment market that we're trying to recruit out of ourselves. Um, we're still suffering from the great resignation slash retirement, uh, our aging workforce, uh, cashing it in uh, during COVID. Uh, we have an extreme housing shortage here in the Upper Valley, which frankly just got worse with uh, uh, Dartmouth's opening of the new uh, tower. And uh, of course, we're competing with New Hampshire hospitals and non-hospitals for back office staff um, who have a great deal more flexibility in New Hampshire uh, to cover the wage increases than we do. Uh, a risk is the Valley Regional Affiliation. We are, uh, that transaction is in the hands of the New Hampshire Attorney General and uh, Dartmouth, uh, Mount Scotney, and Valley Regional are in constant uh, Every week we have work to do in that regard for the transaction. Uh, we had hoped uh, uh, last year that we would have been closing on that July 1st of 23. Well, here we sit in the middle of August. Um, and I would say we'd be fortunate to get a decision out of the New Hampshire Attorney General by the end of October. So now we're kind of hoping for a January 1st uh, transaction date, but even that's a little risky at this point. Uh, lastly, one of the other big um, concerns that, that I've voiced for many years in these hearings, as well as in other settings, is uh, the reduction of dish payments um, um, that was made a few years ago, is the gift that keeps on giving year to year. And uh, the retail side uh, of 340B, uh, essentially, uh, those of us who are able to participate in 340B, uh, that revenue has functionally been cut in half for us uh, at Mount Scotty. So uh, the ongoing dependence on other operating revenues um, has come to roost. And uh, so this also speaks to why we needed to ask for, uh, you know, 2.4% net rate increase. Opportunities, well, Valley Regional also makes that one because there are some potential savings efficiencies that can be garnered uh, with that affiliation. Um, Dartmouth is in a constant state of rational distribution of services in the region, trying to figure out where, uh, where general surgery should be, what do we need for a urology complement within the system, within the region. Uh, we will continue to pursue every opportunity in DH integration, whether it's in the group purchasing world or in the sharing of services or support services from Dartmouth and, uh, and staff sharing. Um, another opportunity going forward is we're a stable organization. We've been very predictable. Our board of trustees recognizes that. Dartmouth recognizes that. I believe that the Green Mountain Care Board recognizes that year to year, we don't have a lot of fluctuation and a lot of change. And uh, I hope that that's of value to you folks. Uh, and market share, uh, we, we still uh, receive about 26% uh, of our business from the state of New Hampshire. We have uh, uh, another uh, high single digit migration from other Vermont service areas to us. Um, I think it's a reflection of the high quality and customer service that we provide and our employee engagement. Um, and uh, we are looking uh, to improve some of the service lines that we've had for the last uh, few years. Most notably, uh, we lost our full-time urologist uh, during COVID. And so we've kind of patched that together with locum services, um, but now we've been able to broker a deal. Joe Paris uh, brokered it before he uh, walked out the door. So we have about a half-time urology service uh, that should be good for the next uh, few years foreseeably. Uh, we're engaged, and we've talked about this the last few years, of uh, secession planning for our ophthalmology professional uh, as he nears retirement. Um, 
regionally, um, and I mentioned this in the uh, global budget meetings, uh, regionally there are no ophthalmologists in Claremont, Springfield, Lebanon, aside from Dartmouth. Uh, and so uh, we really, there's a, there's a need in the community. Uh, Dartmouth is backlogged. Uh, if you decide to go get a cataract procedure at Dartmouth, you'll be fortunate to get in the next six months. So thankfully our current uh, turnaround time is very short, but our, uh, our focus is on our communities and our patients. And there is clearly a need uh, regionally to expand that service. Um, so we are actively recruiting as we have been for the last couple of years. That's a tight market. Uh, and uh, so we're hoping uh, that we can uh, get somebody on the hook over the next couple months. We're also uh, working with Dartmouth on a possibility of a joint recruitment uh, where they would hire uh, someone and we would split the time with them, uh, which would help them improve their throughput and uh, help us with meeting the regional need. And so that's kind of the high view of, uh, of our presentation and trying to address some of the concerns that we were aware that you might have. And we obviously understand that there'll be a lot of detailed questions uh, that you'll probably want to ask. So uh, we'll, we'll tap out on our end as far as the presentation and turn it back over to staff and, and the board at Green Mountain. Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I'll turn to uh, Director Lindbergh and her team for their walkthrough of the benchmarking tool. Uh, good morning. Thank you so much for your uh, prepared remarks. I think they hit a lot of what we uh, had planned to touch on, so I appreciate your uh, preparation for that. Uh, so as you see, uh, Mount Escutney is uh, above the benchmark. Uh, however, um, and we'll update this value now that we know the commercial uh, portion, but uh, the uh, Commercial rate would be 3.4%. So that's the commercial anticipated realized change in commercial revenue um, from fiscal year 23 to 24, uh, assuming a 5.1 charge master increase. Um, of note, uh, one, the green check is a good thing, uh, regulatory compliance. So uh, er everything the board asked for was addressed on time and completely. So uh, always appreciate that. That helps make for a smoother process. Um, and we also um, see a trend here where the operating expense growth and NPR growth are very close. And that's a trend that I think um, tends to show up for organizations uh, with longstanding uh, management of their expenses uh, to a high degree, <laughs> to a very uh, successful uh, extent. So uh, as far as that NPR benchmark, the 12.4 uh, is above the 8.6. We don't have an official benchmark for the operating expenses. Uh, but we see that at 12. Um, one thing I just wanted to give you an opportunity to talk about is in our conversations, Mr. Sandville, it sounds like um, you've been really trying to operate with a skeleton crew and, and trying to make do and that some of the dr driving force here is really right sizing uh, the labor force uh, for, for Mount Escutney. Is, is, is that correct or anything you'd say on that? Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, obviously nobody cares if the finance team is running short. And uh, we're grinding our staff into fine dust. Uh, I'm sure this season you guys all can relate to that. Uh, obviously, we're more concerned with the, the clinical uh, openings. We've been running at 10% uh, uh, below FTE uh, for, for as long as I can remember. I mean, well back into COVID. Um, to put some perspective on it, and I, and I don't want to I don't want to be overly repetitive, but you know a lot of things are connected, right? So um, we have uh, competitive wages. We are not at the top of the market, but we are we are competitive. And um, uh, with the wage studies that come out of Dartmouth and some of the others that we have access to, and what we hear anecdotally during the recruitment process when somebody applies for a job here and somebody apply the same person applies for a job at Alice Peck Day in Lebanon. Yeah, well, I'm taking that job. They're paying me a dollar more an hour. You know, we've got some anecdotal uh, information as well. Um, we're we've got a great environment to work on, uh, to work in. We have extremely high uh, employee engagement scores for the last three or four years. Um, we do a great job. It's a great place to work, and yet we have about 20. As we sit here today, we have about 25 FTEs worth of travelers uh, in our organization. Um, historically, 
uh, really up through the first year of COVID even, um, I think we were running at three to five FTEs at any given moment, going back as many as 10 years that I can account for. So this is uh, a really awkward situation for us. Um, our, uh, we did the first year of COVID, generally people pull in doubles and, and it was unsustainable. And, uh, and, and so uh, we've had to turn to travelers, um, far less than ideal. We've been creative uh, to the extent possible. Uh, we've altered shifts. Um, I, I introduced Baylor shifts into our ancillary departments uh, as an alternative uh, uh, staffing, uh, which brought some uh, staff satisfaction and less burnout, um, but we continue to run tight. And uh, in fact, over the last uh, month or two, um, our acute uh, uh, and swing census, in fact, today was running, we were at 24 out of 25 beds. So, uh, you know, we're running hot on the inpatient side the last few months. And so, um, you know, just for maybe some of the newer members or staff, you know, we work off a, a staffing ratio. So if the staffing ratio for that shift is uh, five patients to one RN, uh, every multiple of five works really well for efficiency, five, 10, 15, 20, 25. Uh, when you cross over into the next increment, six, 11, et cetera, um, you're very inefficient, but in order to meet the minimum threshold. So we have gotten creative with sharing staff between the ED and the inpatient unit, uh, drawing people over at different times, or if one uh, unit is running hot. Uh, and uh, we, we are very blessed to have a, a CNO here who will actually go down and do patient care uh, and plug holes in the ED on weekends uh, to minimize the impact of travelers and, and whatnot. And to be frank, I wish she would do less of that. Um, because I'm chance for but but she's she's a hero. She's an American hero. So uh, uh, that's kind of how we're managing. And it's been a little bit ugly for the last two and a half years, anyways. But uh, we're maintaining our quality and keeping our access up. In fact, improving both. Great. Um, and, and speaking of sharing labor across state lines, I know that's not always a trivial exercise. Um, is that also a benefit of uh, your partnership with Dartmouth and kind of navigating some of that uh, mischief? Yeah, it, it's it, the, the, the catch is you have to be licensed in both states, but uh, with uh, Vermont adopting the, uh, uh, the nursing <laughs> coalition uh, and compact, uh, that's made things easier. Um, but respiratory therapy, RAD, laboratory, um, and we've been, we've already been sharing managers. Our respiratory therapy manager is shared between uh, Valley and Mount Scutney. Our laboratory right. manager is shared uh, between uh, Mount Scutney and, and Valley. Uh, we have uh, managers who do some time at Dartmouth and do time here. And so we've tried to figure out how to broker things with float staff for nursing, RT, uh, and we're probably in negotiations every month on a new position. We just uh, needed a half an FTE and hiring for a half an FTE is ridiculous in this market. So uh, we found out that Valley needed a half an FTE and so we uh, hired a full-time 340B analyst uh, to help us claw back some of our lost 340B revenues. And they work half time for us and half time for Valley. They're very happy. Valley's very happy. We were able to do it as opposed to hiring an FTE and trying to find things for them to do. Uh, we also just did that with an emergency management uh, um, lead. Uh, we were sharing that 50 50 with Valley Regional. So we were able to fill that position with a half an FTE versus a full FTE. Thank you. Um, in looking at kind of labor, uh, I, I see the kind of decline, uh, that great resignation slash uh, retirement trend that was uh, starting to really hit uh, in the post pandemic years um, and seeing, you know, the per FTE growth, you know, a little bit above the benchmark, but also you started quite a bit lower. So when I look at it uh, in totality, uh, you know, you're, you're down toward the bottom. So uh, not seeing kind of any concerns from a staff perspective uh, on the labor and your growth is within the benchmark. Um, not necessarily ever concerned when utilization um, 
is over that benchmark. But I did notice that um, for fiscal year 22, uh, your payer revenue really did not keep pace with the utilization change. And um, I think you've kind of spoken to some of those challenges. Just wanted to give an opportunity if there's um, anything else you wanted to flag related to that, uh, that trend. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's kind of a couple uh, key drivers in that. One is uh, we had a higher Medicaid as a percentage of business. Part of that was Medicaid extending folks um, coverage uh, during the pandemic. Uh, but the other piece of that was uh, just more people qualifying for Medicaid on an ongoing basis with the uh, employment issues that they were dealing with out in the marketplace during COVID. Um, the other thing is we took we took some hits on our uh, provider complement relative to surgery. And last year for budget, we were uh, conservative because the outlook for, um, you know, recruitment relative to urology, uh, Dartmouth had pulled back their pain provider. We, we had a lot of, you know, incremental, I call it death uh, by a million paper cuts, um, but it really hit the OR. And, and so it, it, the OR is one of the better payer mix uh, departments uh, within the hospital. So that, that kind of takes care of 80% of that discussion, Sarah. We also had a lot of borders in the hospital that year. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, high swing census versus acute. Yeah, we had, I think we, we averaged something like six borders for most of last year. Um, we're thankful that as of this week, we're down to four. Um, and uh, nobody over six months, or only one person over six months, they just crossed. So, thank you. Um, and I would just note that maybe people who aren't staring at these graphs as much as I, uh, I would say that this uh, very low, consistent operating expense trend is is unusual, and I think is a testament to some of uh, your focus on those areas, and might indicate some catch up that's going on in the current environment. Um, so obviously you're a border hospital. So um, according to our data, which is uh, certainly uh, not perfect, about half and half in terms of who's coming from the um, White, White River Junction HSA versus uh, from out of your um, HSA. Um, but one thing that I just want to note here is this is one of the um, heaviest uh, population mixes for Medicare. Uh, so, you know, you see how low the bars are for um, Medicaid and commercial and how high they are for Medicare. So that's saying of all the dollars that were spent in the White River Junction HSA, uh, most of those folks are, are going to be Medicare beneficiaries. And of those dollars, uh, most of those do um, are spent outside of the White River Junction HSA. Um, since it's dollars, that's probably generally some tertiary care, probably going to the appropriate facility across the border. Um, but uh, do notice that there's been a little bit more volatility in terms of the dollars uh, over time. And uh, just curious if you think that might be pandemic related or if there's other kind of trends in utilization and what you're uh, observing. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, um, of all the of all of the Tableau uh, um, data uh, presentations, this was the one um, that uh, was maybe the most concerning uh, from a uh, just kind of what what is it um, perspective. And and the issue, and I break this up in other many other state settings. Um, the White River HSA is a is a horrible measure for us. Um, so the biggest practices in White River Junction are independent. They are not affiliated with Manuscotti in any way. They refer to Alspec Day and Dartmouth, mostly Dartmouth for ancillary testing, for surgeries, for inpatient stays. All that goes across the river. It does not come down to us. Uh, once you get below Hartford into Heartland, now, which falls into that, now you're talking about us, but really we bump up against the Springfield and uh, we're in stone's throw distance of Gifford. So the White River Junction HSA actually goes above White River Junction, and we don't even know who those people are. So um, we should, you know, I, I don't, I've been complaining about this for 10 years. I don't know that there's, I don't have a productive solution to offer. So I apologize for just ranting, but, um, you know, really, this is this is Dartmouth experience. This is Alice Peck Day experience uh, at, at large. 
Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I, I do think that moving towards maybe um, a Dartmouth Atlas or another indicator that um, isn't so um, hung up on these state lines that patients maybe aren't uh, would be beneficial. So I totally hear that. Uh, all right. And then um, everyone's favorite page is the cost report. Uh, lots to say about what this is and isn't, but uh, as far as uh, we can tell from what we've got here, uh, Mount Escutney is somewhere, there you are, a relatively small critical access hospital among the peer group. Uh, and we see that you, I, I was um, a little bit surprised that your case mix index was as low uh, as it is here in fiscal year 22, um, given your service mix. So just, uh, is that, I mean, you're probably closer to this than me. Just wondered what your impression was of that indicator. Yeah, so um, um, actually, if you could just move your um, cursor a hair. Yeah, thank you. So, um, so, you know, we went and actually looked at this to see how we were running this year versus last year. Um, you know, our rehab are the highest um, case mix index uh, because they're medically complicated and require a great deal of rehabilitative services. Swing bed is super low and swing bed is essentially, um, I think rehab and swing are 75% of our of our inpatient universe and uh, swing is about 60% of that business, which is generally a case mix in desk somewhere between 0.75 and one, uh, you know, on a, on a, if you were to look at the range of case mix. So this actually tied out to what I would expect to see on here, uh, pretty darn close. And it is what we're running this year. I think last year was 1.18 and this year we're running at 1.17. So it's, it's pretty tight. And that probably is a good segue to, you know, obviously uh, this would be an outlier uh, at the 29,000, but um, if this were a peer mix of other uh, of other hospitals that primarily are doing rehab services, my hunch is that you'd be, um, if not at close to the median, I didn't have a chance to confirm that, but will. <laughs> uh, but so, just, to, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, so, so you, you alluded in your question, your staff questions, um, that our, our, our inpatient service mix, it, it's the same issue as, as the last uh, conversation, except it's more accentuated statistically. So Andrew and I went and just kind of looked at the, the FY22 bus report and looked at our discharges and we did the math and I tied within less than $1,000 of your number uh, looking at it and aggregating it. Um, so uh, we're comfortable with that. If you look at um, rehab by itself, the number's more like 37 uh, as opposed to the 29. Uh, if you look at swing, I think it was somewhere around 34 or 35. And so that's what's pulling everything up. If you look at our inpatient acute, which is again, very small percentage of our business, um, you know, we, we're, we, we fall within the range uh, very easily. But as soon as you add swing, which are, you know, those are all multiple week stays for swing and rehab. Uh, and, uh, you know, swing goes, we have folks in here, you know, now crossing the six month line. So not a lot of discharges with a lot of, uh, charges in day, patient days. So, and, yeah, excuse me. Yeah. And to your point about comparable critical access hospitals, there are less than 10, I think, um, distinct part rehab units with critical access hospitals in the country. So. Um, yeah, if, if if yeah, if you could share that list, um, I'm, I think it seems appropriate to have a different uh, peer group given your uh, unique bimodal <laughs> service uh, situation. I'm sorry, I, I I missed that. Could you say that again? Yeah, I believe there are about there are less than ten uh, distinct part unit rehab um, hospitals, part of critical access hospitals in the country. Thank so you. critical access hospital is allowed to have a 10 bed distinct part unit, which is generally either um, a psych unit or uh, an acute rehab unit. Or a yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, and, and, and so you, what you most prevalently see would be psych or Jerry psych units, um, and especially with the Jerry psych with the, the Medicare population, most CHs have high Medicare population, as Sarah pointed out earlier. Um, but uh, to have an inpatient acute rehab unit, it's uh, you know, uh, Wynn just commented that you know we're a bit of a unicorn, and and that's definitely true. 
it is very difficult to manage the quality uh, in a 10 bed rehab unit. Um, so the people we compete with, so to speak, you know, we don't have any immediately close to us, but uh, UVM has a 20 bed unit. Uh, Rotland had a 10 bed unit, they closed it. Um, Cheshire has a 20 bed unit. Uh, you know, I think there's around 140 beds down in Concord, New Hampshire. Uh, there's some down in Nashua. Then you're down to Spalding in, in, in Boston. And there's Maine Med has one in Southern Maine. So, but they're all much larger units. Um, and so for us to be knocking CARF sur surveys out of the park uh, compared to uh, right. those folks is, is really a testament to our, our rehab director. Um, she they, it's a tremendous you know flagship service for us, but it is makes us a unicorn and creates us uh, having a, a weird dots on uh, whisker charts. So, <laughs> um, and then we've kind of been over the limitations of this indicator. Any uh, thing you want to highlight in terms of uh, some limitations of uh, this indicator that uh, we're trying to get at? Yeah, I, I was a little bit surprised by that. And, and to be frank, maybe it's worth a sidebar discussion um, after these hearings just to see how people were reporting. Um, I kind of laughed at some of the benchmarks uh, who were running down at, you know, near zero, zero and near zero. So, you know, they're part of it or CAH part of some system and everything's back office at the mothership and they weren't counting anything, which is really impossible. Um, but it would be interesting to see how people, what people were putting in that bucket. I feel like when I look around at other CAHs and with the exception of the quality department, we're pretty tight here. Uh, we have, uh, our billing department is, is runs two thirds of what most CAH departments run at. I mean, I just, you know, look at the, you know, it's a handful of departments. It's not a hundred. It's, it's maybe a dozen. Uh, and I look at that and what I know, and I've been able to look under the hood. I've had the privilege of being part of Dartmouth's uh, uh, integration work and performance improvement work in New London and Al's Peck Day and Springfield and Valley. And so uh, I'm coming from Gifford fairly recently. I kind of know where everybody's at for staffing. So I was a bit surprised, um, but we can definitely clarify that. Yeah, I, I'd appreciate your thoughts on uh, improving that indicator. So it, measuring something that matters <laughs> versus maybe some just yeah. accounting. Yeah. Legitimate <laughs> measure. I just think we got to make sure we're all reporting it the same, but I don't feel like we're egregious on there, but um, it, it's, it's, I, I understand the concern. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, for the cash available at the end of fiscal year 22, um, seeing, you know, 44 million, knowing that that's maybe not all unrestricted, but, um, you know, within the kind of middle 50% of the data. Um, and then the only other place where you kind of are bro broaching the, the upper uh, values is related to this uh, earnings per adjusted discharge. From what you've said about the very high unit cost for your services, I'm guessing that's mostly what that is picking up on. Um, but if, please correct me if I've got that twisted. Yeah, we. I actually didn't do the math on this one, but my gut was exactly what you just described. So thank you. Yeah. Okay. Wonderbar. Um, all right. So cost coverage. Um, so we see here um, that. Over time, uh, Mountain Scutney's got a, an unusual pattern in terms of the cost coverage for Medicare allowable costs. Um, I'm guessing that some of this funkiness is going to be the unique services that you're providing, but also guessing your commercial population is very small. So some of that volatility is likely due to small numbers. Um, are seeing, again, uh, less of a kind of downward trajectory, more of an even trajectory uh, among the Vermont Medicaid payments, uh, although we see that starting to creep downward from 21 to 22. Um, and, uh, you know, providing generally a higher cost service, uh, as you described, um, and but the cost coverage, um, you know, not, not really uh, meeting that Medicare allowable cost for Vermont Medicaid and that kind of being made up uh, on the commercial side um, overall. So just don't know if you have any comments about this indicator or if you think we're not getting the signal. No, I, I think when I looked at that and I looked at the comparative, I actually do like the presentation um, in looking at the comparative, 
I, I wasn't surprised by anything. I didn't feel like anything was was way off. Um, you know, we we clearly are getting cost on on Medicaid, and uh, we are all coming in at ninety nine percent of CAHs with a sequestration basically. And uh, um, I, I felt like when I looked at the commercial. Um, I was maybe surprised by this graph at the the, the variation, um, and, and because this is this is really a percentage of costs associated with those services, commercial services. So it, it's it's really not so much a demographic discussion. Um, so I, I was uh, I don't really know what my my conclusion was when I looked at it, but it didn't. It didn't feel wrong when I went back and looked at our revenue model and compared it. Yeah, and I, I don't know if we've done this, but um, I, I just uh, notably these have gone way down since uh, fiscal year seventeen, and I just think um, if people didn't know that, that's an important thing to know. <laughs> uh, so as far as Rand, uh, so again, I think uh, this standardized price per inpatient stay is is really just measuring the services you provide and seeing that on the outpatient basis, uh, you're in that, uh, you know, near the 25th percentile. So I uh, think that this is mostly just measuring service uh, more than, than price per se. Uh, and uh, again, if if you're able to provide those comparators, happy to kind of make sure we're, we're doing you justice in terms of a, a, a comparators. So that is all staff had. Happy to um, hear any other reactions you might have uh, before we turn if it back to the board. To, yeah, if you could go back to the RAND data, please, Sarah. Um, so, you know, and what's interesting about this is, is I'll be curious to see how outpatient looks going forward um, because we did our large price decrease, you know, outside of the Green Mountain Care Board approval in 2020. So that was probably the better part of $2.5 million in ancillaries that we repriced uh, in 2020, which obviously trickled into 21, 22. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Jessica Holmes astutely asked in our hearing, like, are you gonna be able to pull this off? Because we had a very low ask uh, for um, uh, a rate increase that year. I think it was two. I might have been two and change, and uh, and 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 or do you, you're going to need to come back, you know, and reset. And so we were able to, uh, you know, our estimates were accurate, and so we were able to absorb that decrease as well as uh, continue on with a low price increase through that period. So I would expect that that would get better in 21 and 22. Thank you. Um, appreciate your. Straight shooting as always. <laughs> uh, any other reactions generally before we turn it to the board for their questions, uh, Mount of Scutney? No, I think we're good here. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Chair Foster. Thanks. Um, I'll open it up to my fellow board members first if they have any questions. I just have one, uh, which is, could you speak, Dave, a little bit uh, to your thinking around Medicaid redeterminations? Yeah, uh, um, you know, so those, those, as I understand it, you know, started rolling out in April. Um, we have definitely seen um, a small change in our Medicaid percentage over the last couple months. I don't know that it's statistically valid, but it, we're, we're seeing some movement on that. Um, we last, uh, the beginning of this fiscal year, FY23, we uh, liberalized our uh, free care um, policy a bit. So we're trying to kind of glide path to next year's mandate, right? So um, we expect that uh, the folks who are coming off the Medicaid rolls um, will migrate to commercial uh, or free care or bad debt kind of in proportion to where it has been historically. That's kind of the bet we made. We don't think it's all going to bad debt. We don't think it's all going to commercial. Um, they're, they're, one of the issues is I don't know how the exchange is going to handle um, mid-year uh, terminations. Um, to me, this is a one of the life-changing events that allow you to open enroll in the middle of the year is losing coverage. 
um, at least one, the way we offer our program here and most of the other uh, employers as well. So we just kind of figured we're going to be spreading it um, based on historical, and it's not going to be overly radical for any payer group. That's our bet. Thanks, Dave. That's all I had. Thank you. I have a couple questions if I can jump in. Um, so a few things I picked up from your uh, narrative and a few things in the presentation that I'd like to just expand on a little bit. And one was you talked about the telehealth services for emergency medicine and neurology. And I was just wondering if you could describe sort of the frequency those are used and the impact that they are having. Um, it's fairly low frequency. Um, so it's, it, you know, and it's when you need it, you need it. Right. Uh, so uh, I think telepsych has been the most utilized, and we utilize that in the ED as well as the inpatient unit. Uh, neurology, we literally just signed up for that. So other than test uh, testing, we don't we don't really have any practical experience with that. Um, uh, but it's 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 been a it's been a help uh, in a small hospital to be able to get a subspecialty consult uh, on the fly. Uh, with uh, you know folks standing by, um, we you know, one of the things uh, is Scott Rohde, who is the uh, ED uh, medical director at Dartmouth, uh, used to uh, moonlight uh, up at Gifford when I was there, and uh, he loved coming to the CAH to work without a net. That's how we refer to it. Uh, when you're at Dartmouth, you can get the kidney specialist, you can get you know the, whatever you need in short order. Uh, when you're at a critical access hospital, you are working to a degree without a net, and this reduces that and improves the the outcome and the quality. And frankly, sometimes we're able to uh, not have to transfer a patient because we find out that they can be safely managed locally and not put them through the rigmarole of being sent to, to Dartmouth. Well, I think the other piece of it, too, is our ER in particular runs on APPs. Uh, so we are we don't have physicians typically in our ear, so we need some backup to provide them clinical expertise uh, in decision making and, and course of care. So um, that kind of thing, the telesupport in the ER in particular is supportive of how we operate. I, I'll, I'll throw a caveat out because most people don't realize this, that, that um, those uh, telehealth services are not billable. And mainly because of the complexity of the process and the credentialing. And in fact, when we just recently signed for the neuro service, um, I you know pushed back with Dartmouth a bit and said, we've I'll got to push be, back a lot. Oh, I'll push back a lot. Okay. <laughs> that, that nobody at Green Mount Caremore is surprised by that, but thank you for pointing that out. Um, so yeah, I so I did push back a lot. I forgot I'm under oath. I should I should not exaggerate or minimize. Um, and said, you know, you we've got to be able to to bill for this. So Dartmouth is billing us on a per encounter basis for that, um, but we're not able to bill the payer for compensation, and uh, they're not able to, um, you know. And it goes back to if we, for those of us who've been around a long time, um, the Nighthawk services for for rad reads, right? There would be somebody in Australia reading the MRI at 2 a.m. and would send back a read for the ER provider or whatever. And uh, and then the hospital, you know, would bill for that um, because they enrolled that provider into their group. So we would write a check to the Nighthawk service and then we would bill the payer. And that, you know, wasn't always one to one, but it, it was pretty close and nobody complained about it. This is this this service, the way it is designed and the way it is rolled out uh, at this point is unbillable for anybody. So we're just writing a check on a per encounter basis. Uh, and it's well worth it for the infrequency uh, and the, the need. Yeah. Okay. Um, you talked about some volume changes associated with your walk-in clinics um, and uh, avoiding patients having to go to the ED. Um, do, you, do you have any idea if you can quantify those at all? Yes, it's, it's approximately 700 uh, people have been redirected from an ED setting to the walk-in setting. And that's with, that's only Monday through Friday for four hours. So we're actually been discussing, uh, just as Wynn got here, about what's the appropriate expansion for walk-in. 
uh, just because we it, it, we took all those 700 patients out of the ED uh, and those were identifiable. Yeah, thank you for, for posting that graph. Um, this is kind of what we've been tracking. So we talk about ongoing monitoring about services. This is kind of the stuff we do on a regular basis. So the ED was, grow, was growing very quickly. A lot of that uh, covers uh, the COVID time period. Uh, and then you can see a big drop off uh, in ED, ED volume, which is the red line. And now you can see it's climbing up again. And uh, the walk-in clinic is the light green, sage green, whatever uh, line on the bottom. And, and that's been trending up since day one. Um, so we figured it would alleviate uh, some of the staffing in the ER, uh, as well as do the right thing by payers and patients and, and whatnot, and take care of the patient in the appropriate setting. And guess what happened? Well, the waiting uh, at uh, the uh, Madison EED is, is low. Yeah. So, so now we've got this, this organic growth back to the ED again. So now we're having to go back and revisit and say, well, now we have to expand walk-in to shunt some more patients over from the ED. Um, but it's also a benefit. The walk-in's been a benefit for our, uh, uh, our primary care clinics as well to take care of those same-day acute requests that come in because that's what they do. They're set up to do that. And we haven't had, we've had a, challenge for primary care access. So it has allowed access for people who typically would get an urgent appointment with their primary care on any particular day, but there's no capacity in the clinic because we don't have enough uh, primary care providers. So we're working on that. So it's in tandem with primary care and it creates an opportunity in the future to bring some of those patients in to get a primary care with us as we bring on some new providers coming up. Okay. And that 700 patients is what, what time frame? Uh, a year and a half. Okay. Great. Dave, can um, I just ask a quick follow-up uh, question that relates to this, uh, Dave, Chair, Dave Merman? Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, one of the things that I we've heard from primary care providers is that when there's a um, long wait times for imaging, whether it's referral lag or visit lag, that primary care providers will basically send their patients to the ED to get that imaging done. And I did notice, you know, in the referral and visit lag that you do have some wait times for some of these CT scans and, and whatnot. And I'm just wondering, could any of that increase, you know, you've got primary care access concerns, but you also seem to have wait times for the imaging. Could some of that also explain some of the uptick in ED? Um, no, we, we I, I don't know how to say yeah. this, so I'll just say it. Um, you guys should be used to it by now, right? Uh, um, I would kill somebody if they did it. I'd be like, what are you doing? This is, what are you doing? This is not how we do business. So uh, uh, no, so I'm unaware that that has actually ever happened here unless a primary care uh, provider on call over the weekend when the clinic was closed needed a follow up on somebody they saw during the week. That would be the only exception in my mind that would be acceptable here. Uh, as a practice, and even that's, uh, boy, that'd be once in a blue moon. So uh, now I have to go look, Jessica, uh, when I leave this meeting and find out if that's happening. But I have, uh, we do look very tightly at the ED sources, and I get reports from uh, radiology actually reports to me. So I look and I look at all the referring providers and the sources of all the referrals every month. So um, I've never had any whiff of that. Uh, whatsoever. Okay. Well, thank you. Looking at that data would be helpful just to make sure that sounds uh, appreciated. Thank you. Back to you, Dave. Other Dave. Hi. Um, so one thing you kind of answered part, part way through from a question that uh, came up that I've had, which is you talked a lot about the savings associated with Dartmouth. Uh, maybe if I was to sort of eyeball my memory of the Presentation a million and a half, two million dollars between shared savings uh, associated with um, Valley Regional uh, benefits programs, 340B. Um, but as we know, there's costs associated with uh, affiliation as well. And you talked about a nine million dollar uh, IT upgrade that's going to occur here in the next two years. Are there other expected costs that you have that are associated with the Dartmouth affiliation? Yeah, we have, uh, we have a shared service allocation. 
um, that comes down for the services that they routinely provide for us, which to your point is, is standard affiliation. Um, and uh, so you'll be seeing that uh, with Southwestern. You know, right now we're the only Dartmouth, Vermont shop. So, um, you know, it's a little bit different for us than it is for the other affiliates on the New Hampshire side. Um, but we do have a, a shared service allocation um, that, that we're not at 100% allocation, but uh, we're going to be running somewhere is probably around uh, 600,000 and change, I would say, off the top of my head for the upcoming year. And it incrementally goes up uh, as, um, and sometimes it's, it's offset by direct expense leaving our shop. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Uh, and, and sometimes it's a half and half, like for our IT staff, half of them are employed uh, uh, by Dartmouth and half of them are employed by us as we migrate to this platform. Um, and so what, what we do is we take all of our direct expense, we send it up to Dartmouth and then they reallocate it through the whole system. So um, I can't just take my share of shared services and then my own share of local. It has to be all thrown in the bucket and then dispersed by metric. So um, there's never a good way to do this. Um, I've looked at some other systems. They're all doing it the same way to varying degrees. They might use different metrics, but uh, to determine what everybody's fair share would be. Uh, but that will, that will grow as we become more and more integrated. And the goal is that we're able to alleviate direct expense here to offset that as much as possible. That's kind of what we're trying to do here. And gain access okay. to higher quality services like cybersecurity. Yeah. Cyber. We, we couldn't afford to provide the cyber uh, security that Mount Scotty enjoys as a critical access hospital. We would, we would, it would be just a ridiculous endeavor for us. So in that case, when we get a shared service allocation for cybersecurity, uh, it's actually beneficial to us because we're getting an amazing product. Uh, and we're such a small piece of the uh, system that we get a very small, disproportionately small allocation for that. So that one actually works for us both ways. And where's the 9 million expected to come from for the EHR upgrade? So it, uh, at last, uh, we're supposed to have an updated pricing uh, actually this month uh, by the end of August. Um, essentially, uh, the short story is that uh, going on to Epic, uh, the EMR will probably be 3.5 to 4 million of that uh, 9 million. And uh, at this point, probably about 2.5 million for the HR and financial applications. Those are the two big pieces. And then there are some other smaller pieces and some infrastructure requirements, but that's the, that's the 80% of it. And, and the source of those funds to pay for that? Um, so interesting you asked that. So um, if from an accounting perspective, we will be required to depreciate that entire project on our PL. However, it will be funded uh, 2575. So we'll write a check for 25% of the 9 million, and Dartmouth will fund 75% of the 9 million. But the entire project will be required from an accounting principle to be expensed on our PL, which is beneficial to us as a cost uh, critical access hospital, recognizing the cost of the cost. Thank you. Thanks. A um, couple questions from me as well. I'm wondering, um, one of the ex the costs that you reference um, related to the transfer expense, you did a great job of articulating how much the loss has been for some of these patients that you are unable to transfer, you know, once they no longer need a acute care setting between, you know, 2.7, 2.8 and $3 million a year in losses for unreimbursed care. And I'm wondering, um, you know, we've heard from that there is going to be increased capacity of SNFs in the state. And I'm wondering if you've factored that in, do you think that that will impact 60 new beds coming online 
sometime in the next year, we understand, um, trying to find more about that. But will that impact your ability to transfer patients? Will that have any impact on your net patient revenue if you can replace those beds with higher paying acute patients? Um, so the theory would be yes. Uh, you know, so the problem is that some of the patients that we cannot place, they would be hard to place regardless of the number of sniff beds available. Um, they have complicated social issues, behavioral issues, whatnot. Um, so those are the ones that we truly call borders because they're they're uh, you know I I wouldn't report on the board on a border stat the person who had to stay three extra days waiting for a bed to open up at Genesis we wouldn't really consider that in our in our discussion with you or even internally because that's just the complications of doing business um, but um, when we talk about these long uh, long stay patients. I don't know that 60 beds in Windsor would necessarily uh, do anything but move the needle a bit because uh, most of the nursing homes, they're, st they're still understaffed like we are. So they have closed beds. Uh, most of them now uh, have uh, uh, payer percent caps, right? I'm only taking so many Medicaids. I'm only, you know, so um, it's going to be a lot harder uh over time i don't see any material change in that uh to, to speak of it would be great to uh, get a couple people out of here we dog it uh, the care management team meets with me for an hour every wednesday morning and we go over every patient that that could be a problem is a problem what are the barriers to getting them out what creative solutions can we come up with to assist that process it's pretty robust and mm -hmm. We're happy that we're able to move some of these patients. Um, I'm not sure every other place would be able to, but we've been able to, to be as effective as possible, but what we're left with are, are, are near impossible to, to move to any, any setting. So just as a quick follow-up to that, as we embark on this new Act 167 hospital mm -hmm. sustainability work, um, and so there are going to be some recommendations that presumably will come out of that. We've been hearing from multiple hospitals about this concern about transferring patients and, and you know, beds being utilized for subacute care, um, having a cost to the system. Is there a recommendation that you would make system wide? For example, if you were pitching to the legislature, what, what would be your recommendation now to solve this problem? What do we need? I, I, I think uh, when we look at some of the geriatric site needs, um, you know, we, we need to, we need to open some beds for that, uh, uh, you know, Alzheimer's unit, you know, those types of things. Those are the people that are just, there's no, no one can take them. So, uh, there's not, uh, there's, um, a, a facility in New Hampshire called the Ray of Hope, uh, that we send the very complicated behavioral patients who would normally, they didn't have the behavioral issue would be a, a nursing home placement, uh, but they can't because their behaviors, you know, are, are uh, really complicated and difficult. And so, you know, they'll go up there and do medication management and kind of get them into the sweet spot of, of what makes them uh, uh, easier to take and, and what Medicaid, uh, medication regimen do we need to establish for this patient to make them more takeable. Um, those, those specialty um, you know, memory units. I mean, those are the types of things that, that I think would solve a lot of problems. Um, as you guys have probably heard, the VNA uh, has been running radically low in staffing and now has uh, reduced their footprint in New Hampshire and Vermont. So, well, we had some patients who would be, you know, okay, you get them to a certain point and they can discharge home. They have some oversight, but they need some home health. Well, now we've lost a, a good percentage of that as well. So I, I would go with the specialty units would be my first recommendation. If you guys could take care of that for me, I'll call it good. Well, I'm gonna throw it right back at you for a second because you know you you all are in this unique, interesting position where you're working on an affiliation with you know Valley Regional. You're a part of a larger system, Dartmouth Hitchcock and it's and it's all of its satellite areas. 
um, where the system is constantly looking at the rational distribution of services and what the needs are. And, and you mentioned earlier that critical access hospitals have this opportunity actually to add on a geriatric site component to their service line. So I guess I'm my question back to you is, why doesn't Dartmouth hit Hitch, Hitchcock writ large the system and the potential affiliation is this on the table to add a geriatric psych uh you know unit that would take care of this you know for the rest of the state and presumably for Scutney so I have uh I have been in meetings at Dartmouth uh over even the last two months uh where we've talked about uh what could be done uh, one of the fears that they had was opening this new tower that we were just going to take all these subacute patients and fill the new tower, right? And, and, and they have the same problem we have, which is getting people out. Um, and sometimes we're able to help them, sometimes we're not. But they they have been discussing this. They have been speaking to their affiliates. They have been working with the local nursing homes. And these are all things I factually can testify to. Um, uh, but setting up a distinct part unit is a level of complexity. There's a moratorium in New Hampshire on nursing home beds, right? Most states have moratoriums on adding new beds. So um, even with Valley, this has come up multiple times. They have an old OB unit that is largely unused. Um, and so uh, I've been involved in three meetings of what, what can we use that for? And of course, the Attorney General of New Hampshire you know they're interested in in what what, what how that resource of that that space might be used. So those are real ongoing discussions, Jessica. I, if it were up to me, it would be done faster, better. But um, it's very complicated politically, especially with the affiliation and the AG looking at that. As the cost report guy, I'll I'll add a, a piece too. Uh, distinct part units are generally a cost draw from critical access hospitals, so it reduces Medicare reimbursement. That's why there are so few in the country. So um, it will draw cost away from our reimbursement and reduce the margins. Yeah, I I, I think the the when we had the hospital-based nursing home when I first got here, that was in the process of being unwound. Um, and I think that was 22 beds or something like that here. Um, Medicaid was adding a, uh, a little bit uh, to recognize the cost issue that Andrew just referenced, uh, which was great. Uh, Grace Cottage got it, Gifford got it, Maniscotti got it. I believe those were the three at the time. Um, but the nursing home took $2.4 million in today's money. Back then it was like 1.7 but $2.4 million off the table because it was attached to a hospital. So the hospital lost that much reimbursement so that the nursing home could lose money. So uh, now the world has changed, you know, 10 years have rolled by and now there is a greater need for these nursing home beds with the aging population and, and all the things that you already know about. And to Andrew's point, there are a lot, not a lot of CAH is saying sign me up for taking two million dollars off the bottom line, uh, but I will say that I have I developed a, a proposal that's being kicked around where uh, if Dartmouth is able to fill a subacute bed or a bed with an acute patient versus a subacute and subsidize the facility that's losing the cost, these guys stay even and Dartmouth puts margin up. So there is there is a play there. It's very complicated, but the problem is you can't get permission from the state of New Hampshire, which is where most of their affiliates are, to open a nursing home unit uh, and add it and append it to the hospital. So it's just it can, I think it personally could be done, but it's 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 a it's a political hot potato. Well, hopefully we'll have maybe more conversations about the possible solutions here, um, you know, as this Act 167 work continues. And I, I'm sure you'll be tapped for your creative solutions. <laughs> Let me just ask one final question, and it, and it relates actually to the rational distribution of services that Dartmouth-Hitchcock undertakes as it's considering all of these affiliations. Um, does Dartmouth-Hitchcock use minimum volume thresholds to ensure high quality and low cost care? Are there minimum volume thresholds, for example, for orthopedics or for other types of service areas that um, are deployed when they're evaluating those rational 
uh, distribution of services. Uh, I'm, I'm very confident that that is used everywhere uh, at Dartmouth. Um, and even in primary care where there's no you know, procedure minimum volume per year to maintain competency. Um, but uh, it's come up in our, in our discussions about uh, joint recruiting and ophthalmologists for the region. Um, you know, there, there is a minimum number of, of, of cataract procedures that you should be doing in your OR that not only maintain the competency and quality of the provider, but also the nurses and techs assisting them in the, in the OR. So it's really a two level competency. Um, so I'm, I'm very confident to say, yes, they are. And I know that they're doing it in primary care. I know that they're doing it in orthopedics. I know that they're doing it in general surgery. So uh, I think it's an easy assumption that they're, they're using it globally. Fantastic. Then would you be willing to have them see if you'd be willing to share that with us? I would really appreciate seeing what those minimum volume thresholds are um, to ensure quality and efficiency in the delivery of care, particularly as we're embarking on this Act 167 work. So if they would be willing to share that, that would be super helpful. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. Any other board questions? Okay. Um, I think I just have one really little set. Um, on slide 19 of your presentation, you have the request and then you have the various realization percentages. And then what I think in brackets is the um, net rate that you anticipate. Can you walk me through the math on these? Like how, yeah, so, why are you anticipating Medicare realization of 47? Like where are these numbers coming from? So out of the 5.1% increase, Medicare will recognize 47% based on our historical reimbursement rates. So 40.47 times 5.1 equals 2.4. So out of the 5.1, we're expecting to get 2.4, and Medicare typically recognizes 47% of our rate increase. And I know that that may slightly differ um, from uh, what the staff has put together for you. I'm using a model that gets cut differently than how Sarah um, cuts uh, the data. So I won't say that hers is wrong or that ours is wrong. It's just cut different. Uh, but it should be reasonably close uh, to, to what the staff has produced. And so Medicaid pays 27% of that 5.1. Uh, so we realize 1.3% in our payments. Now, I will comment on the Medicaid because that was one of the questions and uh, subjects that came up in our narrative, as well as the subsequent staff questions, is... Um, hey, did you guys book uh, a pickup for Medicaid's um, uh, improvement of professional uh, billing? And so we are very happy that uh, Medicaid uh, threw some money at primary care and, and, and surgeries and specialties. That's great. Totally appreciated. Um, however, we didn't get an increase for inpatient, outpatient, inpatient rehab, and certainly not swing. So, um, when you look at this number, uh, uh, Chair Foster, you'll see that uh, uh, that 1.3 is assuming we were going to get something from Medicaid in all lines of business this year. So we've actually made a bet that's not going to be fulfilled. So we are actually, uh, our expectation of Medicaid realization is actually lower than our model uh, would project. Okay, sorry, and I might be missing something, but the so your your change in charge request is five point one percent, and you're saying you're going to seek five point one percent increase, but Medicare is actually only going to give you two point four percent rather than five point one. Correct. That's when the dollars come in, it's going to be two point four percent on any given service with a five point one percent increase that was a Medicare patient. Okay, and you may have said this, but where did the 47% number come from? It comes from our historical run rate of reimbursement percentages. 
Um, and it's not to the penny because we have anticipated cost report settlements coming in and, you know, but it's, it's, it's pretty darn close and it has served us well over uh, the last 10 years of budgeting. It, it, we, we were seldom surprised. Okay. And so then on commercial, if the care board were to provide uh, a 5.1% increase you're saying that historically you get 67 percent so therefore if we give you 5.1 you're going to get 3.4 in reality that's what this is indicating yes that would be correct okay and then you had said i think in your opening that the net would be 2.4 and that's just taking all these numbers and weighting them and that's how you come to the 2.4 net that you had represented Based on our, our historical service mix, what we budgeted for a service mix, our payer mix, what we're budgeting for a payer mix, and our historical reimbursement rates and other deductions like free care, bad debt. Yeah, we'll get 2.4 of the 5.1. Okay. All right, so the free care, bad debt impacts your realization rate that you're well, putting if you, in if here? Well, you even look at our P Yes, if you look at our P and L and look at take net patient revenue divided by gross patient revenue, it's going to be less than fifty percent. Yeah. And I, I don't think that's atypical for CHs. Okay. And so the sixty-seven percent for commercial realization, that is not directly representative of how much you end up um uh, obtaining in your negotiations with insurance companies, is it? That's based on our current terms. So if we based had to, so if we had to renegotiate with a payer uh, effective October 1st, and you guys agreed to the 5.1, which would seem like a great idea to me, um, then I would be negotiating with the payer to ideally maintain or maybe even hopefully improve, which like never happens in this day and age, but you know, uh, um, our percent realization. Okay. And so is, is that because you have a negotiated uh, discount off of change in charge with the insurance companies? Uh, in, in a couple cases, but mostly not. Okay. Chair Foster, could could I ask a follow up? Um, please. please. I'm I'm still a little bit confused. Um so if my organization made a hundred dollars last year and I applied for a five point one percent increase to my regulatory board and it was granted. This, am I to understand that the the extra five dollars that I made that year, sixty seven percent of those new five dollars would come from commercial payer sources? No. Okay. It, 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 if you understand. were really, if I may try to take your example and change it slightly, um, if you had an X ray that you were billing for and it was worth $100, right? That was your billed amount, gross charges. Uh, and you sent it to Cigna. Let's say Cigna paid the average of our commercial realization rate. Then Cigna would send us $67, forgetting about copay deductible out of pocket. Then next year, um, the Green Mountain Care Board approves your 5% rate increase. So that X-ray is now $105. Um, depending on the length of the contract that's hanging out there and the type of contract, right? Let's say that that yeah. the Cigna uh, wasn't being renewed and it was a standard percent of charge, then they would pay you 60, uh, 67 percent of the 105. So yes. let's call it three and change. So they last year you got you got 67. This year you're getting 71. Yep. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Um, yeah, we we talked about that with uh, hospitals last week. 
how the negotiated reimbursement with commercial payers um, is on a multi-year contract while the budget is changing year to year. So I, I do understand that. So um, that's helpful. I still want to think about um, the rest of your math, but that's very helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, so on the Medicare part, does Medicare change their reimbursement to Madam Scutney based on our budget decisions? No, Medicare, um, sorry, Medicare doesn't give a rat's fanny. Um, they just pay right. us what they pay us after audit of our cost report and our legitimate expenses and our annual audited financials. Right, so sorry. And, I guess I'm still missing how it goes down 53%. Because they don't pay us, they don't pay, they only pay us cost. That that 47% is the percent of charge that they typically pay based on our historical run rate. And we use that run rate to predict the future. So Sarah talked about earlier that if you look at us historically, our expenses and our net revenue run pretty tight. Um, and as long as we stay tight with that, then then this number becomes applicable to the future. Okay. That, I get okay. If if I decided that we were going to pull off a five percent margin next year, then there would be a break with net patient revenue and expenses, and I wouldn't be able to use that predictor for Medicare reimbursement because our uh, expenses would not be growing in line with net, net reimbursement. And Medicare pays by way of interim payments uh, for outpatient um, and uh, you know, per diems for inpatient and then get settled at the end of the fiscal year. Um, and an ideal cost report settlement is close to zero. So you know, we like to maintain uh, uh, very solid interim payment rate. All right. Um, so, any other board questions? Um, just just one more on this same thing. So the the calculations that um, you shared with us on this slide, but th you use those um, to monitor your expense growth and keep your expense growth tight to your expected revenue. Is that correct? No, no, they're, they, we relate them and we compare them, but they don't drive them. So if I, if I were to answer, how do we budget? I ask my people three things. One, how busy are you gonna be in your department next year? How many people do you need to perform that level of volume, which we test against historical productivity? And how much stuff do you need? paper clips, bandages, whatever. And then we, we, uh, we run that data through, and then we look at what, what amount of price increase do we need to cover that expense growth. And, and we do that based on our historical reimbursement rates from all payers. So they're done in concert, but they don't, one, Expenses drive the bus more, but net revenue growth, you know, sometimes we have to go back and re keep revisiting the expenses until we can line those two things up and decide what we can live without and, and what we need to have. Thank you. Okay, I'll turn to the healthcare advocates. Hi, um, thank you, Chair Foster. Uh, this is Charles Becker from the Healthcare Advocates Office. Just have a quick question about your pharmacy charges. Um, on page four of your narrative, you said our pharmacy prices are based on acquisition cost, so no price increases are applied to pharmaceuticals. And that stood out to me in a really good way. <laughs> and I was going to ask you today if that actually meant your pharmacy costs are flat. But then on one of your slides today, you said pharmacy is up two to 8% with the highest cost meds up greater than 4%. So I'm just trying to reconcile those two statements, if you could speak to that. Yeah, fair. Um, so um, this is one of those examples 
um, where uh, two things can be true. So um, we, when I got here, um, we had a multiplier for drug costs, a hundred bucks. We do a multiplier and it, it's this. And so um, it's high and um, it's distasteful. And so literally for 10 years, we have never increased um, our pharmacy markup to cover now. I mean, every year we get zero. Literally every year I've been here, it's zero. Now, if, um, if there's, uh, that product gets replaced with a new and improved product that costs more, which is usually what happens, right? Um, we use the same markup. We don't change it. We don't, we don't, we don't take last year's $500 med and make it 505 this year. And none of that happens. That said, in the uh, inflationary question uh, that you referenced secondarily, uh, so yeah, depending on the, 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 the drug that we're talking about, um, so infusion drugs, uh, whether chemotherapy or medical infusion, those are all on the higher end of the inflation spectrum if you were to go back and look at the, uh, the, the trade journals, and um, the others not so much. So if their if their pricing changes, that's our acquisition cost. But we never change the markup; it stays it stays relatively flat. And what happens is, as things become generic or not the bleeding edge, right? Then there's actually a regression in price. Um, and on top of that, we we go after the 340B mixed use discount, which is roughly 20%. Does that help, or does that make it more murky? No, it, it helps actually, and 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 one of these days I'm going to figure out pharmacy pricing, uh, but probably not today. But I appreciate your response. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and I'll open up. And uh, we have no further questions. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's great. Uh, any public comments? Uh, Mr. Davis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, I've sort of made this comment before, but the, the uh, today's activities and the activities of the the, the uh, budget discussion so far have just made it seem much even more more important. And that is that there, we just have a huge air aura of unreality here. It's a, it's particularly difficult, of course, in the in the valley, which is just a tangle, um, and does is going to be hugely difficult to make any real sense out of. Because Dartmouth, okay, is is so huge, and Dartmouth should be doing uh, has to has to do all of the tertiary care, and tertiary care is where all the money comes from. So the the small hospitals, especially in Vermont, but they have small hospitals everywhere, have a terrible time uh, making enough money doing the stuff they have to do. Um, so they try and make up the revenue problem, revenue deficit, by by doing as much heavy stuff as they can they can manage. This is all actual. There's a huge amount of data to sh to show this, no, but this board has not looked at it at all. It's, they have not looked at stuff like um, the uh, leapfrog tests for surgical volumes. They have not looked at. The, the uh, problems with the quality problems uh, of the Vermont system, as shown by the PQI and PAU data. Uh, they have not looked at cost per capita in the service area, which is the real, the real, the real way we pay for health care. We pay for health care on a per capita basis, not an individual way, on an individual basis. And nobody has said anything about all the consultant work that shows that Vermont needs 154 at least, at least 154 fewer beds. That would account for six whole critical access hospitals. Um, the problem about this, of course, is that it's so painful. I mean, it's politically painful, but that is the reality. And until it's a, because we, we don't need 14 hospitals, we need maybe four, and maybe less than four. Okay, and the the ultimate I think of it. I've never the, the first really. It's interesting. The first thing I've ever heard that got started to get at this area was Member Holmes today wanting to know from Dartmouth. Well, are you going are you going to get enough volume to get make your service areas look service uh, lines look uh, reasonable? Well, can we, if you find out from Dartmouth, will you tell us? Well, 
what you have is you have t you have a pile up to the ceiling of data in your archives that tell you exactly the answer to those questions, okay? And the problem is not that the data isn't there, but that is the political will isn't there. Thank you. Okay. Any other public comment? Okay. Uh, I'll turn it back to the Mattis Cutney team for any closing remarks you have. I, I appreciate your time and it's always fun to see you guys every year. I look forward to this and then I look forward to my post Green Mountain Care Board vacation. Um, it, but uh, I, I think the one thing that, that really I, 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 I think we should think about, there's nothing to determine here today, is, um, you know, our volume is not because we're marketing. Our volume is our volume. It's because we have community-based services that we're providing at a high level of quality with a high degree of patient satisfaction. Um, we don't we don't have an orthopedic subspecialty. We're not doing plastics here. Um, we're we're just providing good quality community-based care, and. Um, I think our, our rate increase is, is very reasonable. Um, the, the issue with the net patient revenue growth is primarily volume, which we actually can't really stop uh, from happening. And I'm pleased that people want to come here and use our services. Um, I think it's beneficial to the state of Vermont. Uh, it's beneficial to Mount Scutney that if uh, we're able to enhance our volume, from outside this state, um, it's a benefit to everyone involved here in Vermont. I can't say the same for uh, the person losing the business on the other side of the river, but um, there, it's an increase to provider tax, it's an increase for jobs, um, it, it has a, a multiplying effect over time. And um, I would hope that you guys would uh, uh, consider that uh, in approving our budget. Um, we're, we're, we're not generating new business. We're just taking care of whoever shows up and doing the best job we can. But we appreciate your consideration and uh, uh, look forward to a, a favorable response. Well, thank you very much. And um, Mr. Uh, Brown, it's nice to meet you. And um, well. we will adjourn. Thank you. And we'll adjourn till one o'clock.